Mm. How are you, Megan? Mm, yeah, good. I mean, uh, I would say I've, I have like done the reading for this and caught up on the reading for last week, but I would say in the minimum possible way, <laughs> I've done that. <laughs> so yeah not feeling Reach totally to the stars yeah <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm feeling totally uh, on top of everything that's um, our six made more sense than S, uh, S3 somehow oh I think I agree with that yeah. one thing I, yeah mm -hmm. I mean he says at the beginning of this chapter like warning you may be tempted to use R6 I, I encourage you not to <laughs> Which, like, maybe by the end, once we go through S4 and then we do the little comparison, we'll be like, okay, we'll try it. But... <laughs> yeah, it seemed to be like, because it's not, like, idiomatically like R normally is. Yeah. And I guess, but I also like, <laughs> you know, you know, I feel like, I feel like, do what feels right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, one thing I'll say with R it feels like there's almost no idiom idiomatic R because you could do yeah, I agree. in like base R, you could do it in data table or with data analysis stuff, or you could do it in deep in tidyverse way. And each of yes. those I could argue is its own idiomatic way of speaking R. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, this yeah. is why some people really hate R. I think there's just too many ways to do things. <laughs> um, okay, I'll get started then. Cool. Um, okay. So R6. Um, R6 is the version of R object oriented that is the most like other object oriented programming languages. So I Googled this um, quickly, um, the idea of encapsulation and most object oriented programming languages or kind of frameworks deal with this idea of encapsulation, which I think you could argue is not really handled by S3. Um, and so the difference between S3 and R6 is that R6 methods belong to the objects and they are not belonging to the generics. So the methods belong to objects, not to generic functions. R6 R6 objects are also modified in place, and this is in contrast to everything else in R, which is copy on modify. And they do this because R6 is built on top of environments. And this is just from the CRAN page of R6. So it's basically telling you that R6 is the implementation of encapsulated object-oriented programming for R, um, and just some of the features, and I thought their hex code was cool. Um, it was cute, especially because they're calling it essentially classical object-oriented programming. So why R6? It's a joke. That's it. Like, <laughs> apparently it's it's just a, um, a name joke from S, S3, and then they started calling it S, R5, and R5 never became a thing. And then an actual package got developed called R6. So it's a joke. So our first R6. So R6 is not a native part of the R programming language and you do actually have to install it. So here I've just kind of called an install. Um, this is something I tend to throw at the top of R markdowns when I send them to collaborators um, because the Pacman package will install packages and load them into your workspace. So if you're sending an R markdown to someone else who may not be great at using computers. Sometimes I'll throw this at the top. So they're not like, oh, how do I install? Just something I do. Um, okay. So interacting with R6 is actually really only one function. So this is just kind of showing you in R Studio. if you look what functions are associated with the R6 library, there's only three. Um, and those are is R6, is R6 class, and R6 class. So in all of our interactions with creating objects of the R6 class, we're going to be using the function R6 class. So by convention, when we make a new R6 object, we should use upper camel case names. And we create a new object like this. So we're going to make a new R6 object class called accumulator. We're going to do it by calling R6 class function. Our first argument should be class name. 
followed by public, private, and then there's a few other things. So then to make a new instance of the R6 object, we simply assign something to it like my accumulator and we call accumulator dollar sign new. So to get more into depth of what's inside of this function here. So class name, it's not actually required, but you should probably use it um, for two reasons. One, it's gonna make it a lot easier for you to debug. And two, in, when we do S3, S3 uses this name to use generic functions like print or mean or something like this. So you should use it. Um, you should also make it the same name as your generator here. So class name accumulator, my new accumulator is gonna be called accumulator. The public is a list and that list is going to contain all of the things you want other users to be able to have access to. So public list has sum, which is just gonna be an integer. It's gonna have a function, which is called add. And we're gonna define that function here. I'll get into it more in depth a little bit later. And then we've also got private. So we're not gonna talk about private this week. That's gonna be next week, um, but I'm just letting you know it's there. You define it right at the beginning. Um, and private is something that once you've made an instance of your object, you're not gonna be able to go back and tweak those things externally. So for example, this my accumulator, I've just printed it out. We see that it's an accumulator class. It has these public functions, add, clone, sum, that has private fish and kill the fish. Um, and if I actually try to use any of these methods or um, objects inside of the my accumulator, I can only get access to add, clone, sum, and enclosing environments. For now, ignore clone and enclosing environment, just sum, add. And I don't actually have access to fish or kill the fish from outside of the object. When you're creating R6 functions and methods, um, you should use snake case. Again, as Hadley said in the last chapter, these things are not enforced. If you want to name something like totally crazy, you wanna have a class name completely different from your generator name, you wanna use camel case for functions, you can do all those things. Nothing's gonna stop you. It's just, you know, think about your end user, which is usually yourself in two months trying to debug your own code. So let's create our first little R6 object. Um, or rather let's use it. So methods and fields actually belong to the object. And to access those methods and fields, we use the dollar sign. So we make our accumulator like this, new. Nope. And if I wanted to get access to that sum, I would just call dollar sign sum and it's zero. And if I want to use the add function, um, I call it add and then the function 42 sum and now sum is 42. So it's updating itself and we call it with the dollar signs. There is this concept of method chaining in um, R6. And so an example of this is when we called the function myaccumulator add 42, we were mostly interested in the side effect of the function, which was updating the myaccumulator sum. So now to actually go what's inside of this function, as I kind of skipped over it the last couple of times. So we're going to make a public function that we can call from outside the instance of the object. Um, we're just giving it a default, like any normal function we would create in R. Now, when we are trying to update fields that are inside of the object, we use this self term. So here, because what I want to do is add the sum that is contained within the accumulator class, we're going to call it self dollar sign sum, which we already defined as a field here. If you tried to do this self uh, dollar sign potato, you would get an error because no such thing as potato exists. Um, then I add self sum plus X, and then I'm returning invisible self. So the reason why we wanna end with invisible self is that this is now kind of invisibly returning the object back. <clears throat> and this allows us to do method chaining. So we can do something like my accumulator, add 42, add 100, add one minus, minus 100 sum, and that'll all chain together in one, one uh, function call. 
And we can, of course, also put it on new lines so that it's easier to read as well. So kind of like a mental overview when you're thinking about creating objects and then instantiations of this class, the first thing you do with object-oriented is you're making this accumulator R6 class, and then you can make new instances of those. So my accumulator, a different accumulator, a third accumulator, and each of those have their own sum and their own add function. If I change the sum of this one, it has no impact on the sum of this one. If I change the function somehow, it would not affect the function here. So there's this idea that these, these instances of the class have no relationship to one another once they have been created. They're out there in the world doing their own thing. So there are two methods that are recommended that you have when you make a new R6 class. The first is initialize. So we're going to make another R6 class, and this one's going to generate people, and it's going to use an initialize function. So initialize is going to overwrite the base new, so that when you call new, it's going to use the parameters of whatever you determined the initialize to be. So we're going to make a person generator, R6 class, class name person, public. Um, people have names and they have ages. And we're going to make an initialize function, which will take in a name and an age. It'll do very basic checks. So it'll check character, it will check numeric, it will check that the length is the right one. If you want to have more stringent checks on a correctly made object, that should be a separate function from initialize, which is probably called like validate. Um, but it's similarly, like in S3, you want to try and keep these things as separate from one another as possible. Um, and so we can create a new person called albro1, um, person new in the same way, except now we actually supply arguments. So name al, age 27, we print it out, and we have a person with the public objects, age 27, clone, init, name al. So the next one you want to use is a print function um, that you should you know, include in your new cl classes. So again, this is exactly the same, but I'm adding a print function here. And now this print function is going to take three dots, dot, 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 like this. Um, it'll spit out the name, the age, it'll say what a cool human, and it's going to invisibly return the self. So we make a new object of albro2, a person, new, name, al, age 27, albro2, person, al, 27, what a cool human. So what do we think happens when we call albro1 versus albro2? So for the, the second one, you'll have this kind of new print, this new way of printing, but for the first one, because, it, uh, because it's like a separate, uh, I can't think what the word is, subclass thing that's been created. <laughs> uh, it will, it's it's not affected by the fact that you've added that in to another one. Ooh, yay. Yes, of course. Um, <laughs> so, yep. Yeah, so it didn't affect the print instantiation of the Albro one. I, I, I keep saying instantiation instance, but I don't know if that's the terminology R uses or if it's even the right one. It's just I have a memory in the back of my head that you call it an instance of an object. Oh, that's right. Um, so yeah, this is the idea behind encapsulated methods is that each of those methods, once you created the, the instance albro1 and put it into the universe, it had its method, it had its like fields, and that's what it was going to work with. So we can add methods to a class after we've created it. We don't need to make it all in one go. We can add a method afterwards. And we use that using the set. So here on my person generator, I'm going to use set. I'm going to say it's going to be public. I'm going to call it how many months. And I'm going to assign it a function, which is going to take the self age, multiply it by 12, and then print out a little informative message. So now we can say albro3, um, 
al 27 and we can call the function how many months and it will say al has been alive for 27 years that's 324 months so as before um, Albro 1 and Albro 2 would not have access to this new method of how many months. So R6 also, of course, has inheritance, and inheriting is very, very easy to do. Um, so now we're going to make a new class called a student, which is a subclass of a human, because I believe we all agree that students are typically humans. So we'll make a class name student and to inherit from person all we write is inherit person so if we have an existing object already who's called person that's all we have to say inherit person so now we've got our publics um, i'm going to add two more fields which is going to be program and years left i'm going to write an initializing function uh, which is going to work a little bit differently so function name age program years left um, again a simple check that the program and the years left are the types and the lengths that i expect them to be and then i will assign the program years left and now i'm going to do something different so here what i'm doing is super dollar sign initialize name age so what this is doing is saying now rather than me writing out an entirely new initialize function for the student object I'm going to say call the initialize function from the person object using the name and age that I've input here. Similarly with print, I can say call the super print, so call the person print. And then um, I'm going to define an extra bit here, which is unique for student objects. And then I can add another function here, which is a student function, which won't be present in the person class. So we make a student, um, student new, we provide name, age, program, years left, and we print it out. And now because Albro student is a student object, it will print here the human print, and then it will add this other extra bit. Al is a student, Al has three years left in their PhD program, Al should be writing. And then we can also add this little function here, which is, you know, unique to student class, which is panic. Um, so Alvaro panic three, L has three unfinished sign in on assignments, panic. So this is kind of the idea of inheritance and it's fairly easy. And again, there doesn't seem to be, unlike other programming languages, a lot of checks to make you not do something stupid with this. So try to not do anything stupid. Um, next, there's this idea of introspection. So this is really simple is that Every R6 object also has an S3 class attribute. So we can kind of examine this by looking at the attributes of the student, which has the class student person R6. Again, class, you can see student person R6. And you can see everything that's inside of an R6 object just by calling names, which gives you enclosing environment, years left, program, age, name, clone, panic, print, initialize, how many months. So these are all the things that are inside of your R6 object. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the first section. Um, and then I kind of walked through the first two exercises. Um, I'm, I'm happy to go through this one, kind of bit by bit and talk through my, my mental process on it. Um, so our first exercise was creating a bank account, uh, which is an R6 class that stores a balance and will allow you to deposit and withdraw money. So we call it bank account, bank account. Uh, we assign balance as one of its things. Uh, we make an initializer function, which does a simple check. We give it a print function like this, um, we deposit. So depositing here, I've, I've put a lot of printing fluff to make it very pretty, um, but this has basically the glue of this happens with self balance, self balance plus X, returning invisible self so that you can chain it. Uh, similarly withdraw, self balance, balance X, invisible self, 
Um, and then I've got some code that kind of goes through it. Da, 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 da. And this will print a lot of stuff. So we make the account, we deposit, we withdraw, we deposit, we withdraw, we deposit. We make a second account. Now we give it an opening balance. Um, we, would, we can withdraw, deposit, withdraw, deposit in this chaining manner. So this is kind of just trying to illustrate this all. Um, okay. So create a subclass that there's an error if you get attempt to go into overdraft. Um, so I tried to use inheritance on this one because um, I think I, I like the idea of inheritance because it means you type less and I am a very lazy person and I do not like to type. Um, so I called him bank account no overdrafts, um, bank account no overdrafts, um, inheriting from bank account. And the only thing I've updated here is the withdraw function. So now the withdraw function, it's going to tell you again that it's withdrawing. If the balance goes below zero, it will abort with rlang abort, and it will say you cannot um, withdraw. And then I'm just going to use the super function, which is the bank account, super withdraw x, because if I get to this point, it means that this was not going to put me negative, and this error was not going to have occurred. So I will get down here, and then I invisibly return myself. So I can. This no overdraft account, deposit 100, withdraw 10. Um, this will work fine, it'll print out some pretty things. But if I try to withdraw 1000, it will tell me you cannot withdraw 1000. Cool, that's very really nice. And then, I mean, this was kind of the same thing. Um, Again, this time I've added a fee. So this is create another subclass that allows you to go into overdraft, but will charge you a fee. Um, these are really sad examples. Um, <laughs> so again, we inherit from bank account. We make our public things here. Um, we set it up as fee, NA, we initialize, balance is zero. I'm gonna just say fee is gonna be 10. Um, our initialize is again using the initialize function from the bank account. Um, we assign B and then our withdraw function will say, again, you only have X, it'll give you a warning. Um, this time a message rather than stopping you, it's going to then withdraw that fee from your balance, self balance, self balance, self fee. Uh, use the withdraw function from the super class and again, invisibly return self. So we can now make our overdraft account in the same way. Overdraft fee new, overdraft withdraw, withdraw. Um, and we can make a higher one. So for example, now we see the fee is 100. We start with a balance. And this will, it'll tell you that it's charging you your overdraft fee. Um, this one, which is apparently a very bad bank account, will charge you an overdraft fee of 100 every time you make an overdraft. So this is this was kind of the my my logic through going through this first first exercise, um, and then I don't know if anybody did exercise two. Okay, do you want to share yours? You nodded. I saw you nod. Okay, now I found the mute button. Um, the second exercise was, ah, the, the card deck. Cards, yeah. Um, yeah, I can share. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Where is my Zoom? Here, okay. Share screen. Okay, can you see it? My my um R. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. 
So I hope I can still get through it. So we had this, um, the exercise to create an R6 class that represents a shuffle deck of cards. And you should be able to draw cards from the deck with draw and return all cards to the deck and reshuffle with reshuffle. Um, and this was the code for preparing the deck of cards. So you have um, the four symbols and then all the yeah, all the possible 52 cards are in there then in the end. And um, so this is how I prepared it. So I have shuffled cards um, with the R6 class shuffled cards. And I um, have the, what is it again? The value deck. Field? Field? Field. The field deck. Um, which should be the char a character of uh, length 52. And in my initialize, I um, used the deck. Uh, just have the simple check if it's a character and length um, 52. And then I say that the deck should be a sample of those uh, cards um, without replacing them so that we have just a shuffled card deck in here. And then you have the function draw. I also put some text in there. Um, and then, um, yeah, you provide n how many cards you want to draw. And this is basically then just drawing the first n cards and removing them from the deck and inv invisibly returning it. And then you have the reshuffle function, which then again samples the original cards so that you again have um, all 52 in there. Just gonna, not sure, yep. Okay, and then I have it already here, but you can then just um, initialize a new card deck, draw three cards and you see here it's eight, eight of uh, spades of, no, eight of spades, eight of, <laughs> what is this? Clover and six of clover, and then uh, reshuffle the card deck, and then you can draw again, and then the three cards will be different cards. Yeah, that's like a pretty good draw. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. Uh, okay, so should we talk about the next question, which is like a conceptual one, which is you've got it on your screen, I can see um, <laughs> why oh. you shouldn't. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, why you shouldn't use um, or why you can't use S3 for bank accounts or for um, cards in this manner? I wasn't really sure about that. Is it because of the, um, because you basically add the methods now here to the objects and with S3, S3 you cannot do that? Or was there? Anything else? So I had an example kind of of why it would be a bad idea. Um, I'm just going to share it like this. Um, so let's make sure that I make my thing here. Let's see what I have cards. Um, I make my deck. No, it work. I'm I'm missing something. I don't have this loaded. What? Oh, well. <laughs> Live coding is always so stressful. Um, okay, we'll make the deck cards. Uh, we just do the similar thing, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, so. We could do this as an S3 or even as a vector, for example. So if we wanted to make an example deck like this, um, and it works conceptually in the same way, except now that I've, now I've essentially just got as a character vector instead. Um, and we can use lobster to check it out. So here it is, reference, um, and we can draw three cards randomly, uh, remove those from our deck using just kind of base our um, vectors. You know, we, we don't need to have an object to do this, of course. Um, the difference is that now you notice, or at least this is kind of conceptually why I thought it would be a bad idea to do, is that 
because we're not using R6, we have the copy on modify. So now the address is completely different. And so we've copied the whole deck of cards, which is not really a big deal for the deck of cards. But if we had a massive object, which was like, for example, the object was someone's credit card history, which might contain every transaction they've ever made or every call that's ever been made on them, something like this, maybe then it would be problematic. This was kind of my logic of why you wouldn't want to use it. Um, versus if you do this with the our deck, um, there's a lot of information here, but this is the deck of cards here. Da, da, da. And we draw from it in the same way and we get the same object in memory. So because it's using the modify in place rather than cop that rather than copy on modify, that was at least the reason I thought it might be mm. more useful. Um, but that's, I don't know if that's like the right answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's other reasons. I also think that, sounds, that this sounds plausible. I also find that I, at least conceptually, the idea of using, um, even base R or, or, um, like S3 doing something like this sounds like it might be less less portable to me um, and also like because you know when you, you create your little deck builder which is not a big problem when it's a deck builder but if it was like you know entire history of person's life builder it's you can pop it in and out I don't know this is this is my kind of logic on this one um, do we want to go through the next functions? I, I, I think the next two, um, exercises are pretty much the same thing. They're just kind of practice in creating an R sub object. So I don't think they conceptually teach us that much more, but th that was just me. I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was like a lot of typing at the end. I was like, oh, this is the same thing. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's that's it for this first bit. Um, that didn't feel that. too bad, did it? <laughs> no. Uh. Yeah. In the last question, um, I was just wondering the base type R six objects oh. are built on top of. Is that environments or? I thought I thought it was environments. Yeah. Yeah, I remember it. In when the. When, when you put uh, type off and then uh, the R6 object, it says it's an envi en environment. <laughs> that was. Type of. Type of. Um, yep, environment. Hmm. And then what attributes do they have? What attributes do they have? Attributes. That's the, the class, like. Yeah, is that the class? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. so basically the, the inherited classes and the class and R6. And then R6. Yeah. <laughs> ah, we did it. <laughs> Very nice. Easy, easy. Thanks. And then we really we'll do oh, pretty useful. Who's doing, yeah. who's doing next week? Is it Anne? Yeah, I, I, I said I would do it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah, it should be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this was, yeah, this definitely, I don't know, I don't quite know why, but it does feel more intuitive to me than S3 did. Although I appreciate I also missed like half of S3, so that probably didn't help. <laughs> I, I was going to say that as well. Oh, I think this this feels quite intuitive to me in terms of if I want to really use object oriented program. This sort of made sense to me, I guess. But like like you, I've not really. I've I'm still trying to catch up on the S three. So, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, no, that was great, Annabelle. Thank you. I mean, we I, I agree with you, and I also read S three. So, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe yeah. we're going to be convinced, guys. Yeah. 
Maybe we're going to be really convinced by S4. Ooh. <laughs> yep. Uh, cool. Okay. Awesome. Well, I will uh, endeavor to, to do a good follow up in the next half. All right. See you yep. next week, guys. All right. Okay. See ya. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.